welcome to Law to Talk About. I'm Jay Cleary, your host. Before I introduce you to my guest for tonight's program, I'll read our usual disclaimer. This program is sponsored and produced by the Haverhill Bar Association as a public service. The legal matters and issues discussed on law and presented during the course of this program are not intended to constitute legal advice or counsel. The subject matter discussed in law to talk about is for general educational and informative purposes only. If you have specific legal questions, please consult with an attorney. Well, my guest for this evening is an attorney, but more importantly, she is our local state senator, Senator Catherine, Kathleen O'Connor Ives, and thanks for being on my program. Happy to be here, Jay. Thank you for inviting me. Thank and you. And you're back again because we did a show about a year and a half ago, and I was planning on making this at least an annual event because it's great to sit with you and find out just what's going on, particularly in the State House in this year, 2016. And there is a lot going on. Plenty to talk about in the yeah. world of recent legislation. Yeah. So we're sitting here on March 21st. Um, it snowed this morning, but the snow will be gone by tomorrow. And I thought we could start off with, uh, I think you said one of the big issues right now is, has to do with family caregiving. Happy to. So there's one particular bill that I co-sponsored called the CARE Act. Mm -hmm. And Senator Linda Dorsina Forey of Boston, she filed that bill in this legislative session. And it was a, a great coincidence because the Senate president actually sent me to D.C to a one-day conference on caregiving and those related bills. And the CARE Act was one of those bills that they focused on. So I actually had an opportunity to talk to legislators from other states that had passed the bill mm -hmm. to ask them how it went. And we also heard strong advocacy from the AARP that is really working hard to pass this bill because over 21 states have passed this piece of legislation. And I think that Massachusetts should follow suit the, uh, the CARE Act stands for Caregiver, Advise, Record, and Enable Act. So we know that caregivers very often are responsible for really important tasks like wound care, operating equipment like nebulizers and right. monitors, mm -hmm. managing special diets and complicated prescription medication, and they need to be empowered with the information to do that well because their work saves so much money, not only for themselves, but also creates a system of self-sufficiency. Seniors and loved ones can stay in the home. And the, the bill itself is comprised of three basic pillars that I'd like to describe. Firstly, very simply, the name of the official family caregiver should be recorded by the hospital so that they have that designated mm -hmm. status. And secondly, that caregiver should be apprised of all of the pertinent medical information that would be necessary. And you would think that this always happens, but that designated caregiver would then be notified every time that patient, that inpatient setting, is either discharged home or discharged to another facility. And lastly, before the patient is discharged, the official caregiver would get instruction and live information so that they could actually see how they would have to take care of that patient when they get home and have the opportunity to ask the medical provider for any questions that come up. Because once they're discharged, it's going to be a lot harder to get those questions answered. You know, you brought up a great point. And I brought with me the um, Boston Globe from March 8th. And in the editorial, it was family caregivers deserve legal standing. Mm -hmm. Just a coincidence, I didn't realize this was going to be the first subject we'd talk about tonight, but the Globe in the editorial talks exactly about this law and why it's so important for caregivers. And um, I, I was a caregiver myself for my mother, who lived to be 90. Um, I'm aware of the challenges that I and my siblings faced uh, providing the care that she needed. And as an elder law attorney, I've sat in on more than a few discharge planning meetings, either at a hospital or at a, a rehabilitation or long-term care facility. And there's a lot to it. And oftentimes, there's almost so much information there that people aren't able to kind of comprehend it all. Or sometimes, in the opposite, there isn't enough information mm -hmm. for these family member caregivers who are going to be taking home their parent, their spouse, their um, sometimes their child. 
Right. It could be a reverse. Absolutely. So you might have an elderly person taking care of their child for one reason or another. I brought with me some interesting statistics about Massachusetts, and it's notable that over 844,000 Massachusetts residents currently provide in-home care for an aging parent or a loved one, and over $11.5 billion annually are conducted in unpaid services that would otherwise be compensated, right. but you know these people are doing it for free. And what's so interesting is most of the caregivers either have a part-time or a full-time job right. simultaneously. Yeah, there are a lot of people, as we said before the show, who are doing this. Uh, they're not getting compensated for it. They're doing it because it's something they need to do, they want to do for the persons that they love and that have cared for them, and it's now their turn to step up. Mm -hmm. But um, whether it's somebody in what's referred to as the sandwich generation who may have an older parent and younger children to take care of, or as you said, have a full-time job or even a part-time job, or the person they're taking care of lives 45 minutes away or even longer sometimes, that adds even more stress to the caregivers. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine the difference it makes when a caregiver feels empowered to know how to properly do the tasks that are required, and that's going to really strongly impact the readmission rates to hospitals. Right, and that's a, that's a huge goal um, in our health care problems is not to have repeated readmissions. Exactly. In terms of saving costs. The other uh, statistic that I thought was really interesting is that the majority of caregivers feel overwhelmed by the responsibilities that are placed upon them, and that's yeah. why I think this legislation could provide some relief. Yeah. What was your, your take in talking with other legislatures, legislators when you were down in Washington, D.C., about how the program's doing in some of the other states? Did you get a feeling from those persons? I did. Uh, those states felt strongly that it was a very common sense thing, but there had to be an education campaign mm -hmm. so that people would realize that it wasn't a huge burden that was being placed. And I think that there would also have to be a strong line of communication to medical professionals and the medical field so that there could be a clear understanding of expectations right. because they also don't want to be overwhelmed with a liability issue yep. or uh, certain mandates that would distract them from their other duties. So I think that there is a way to create a common sense compromise because no matter what, whether this bill gets passed or not, the caregivers still have to do that work. That's right. So why not give them the proper information? Yeah. Is there any advice that you could give based on your research for people that are serving as caregivers right now, things that they should be aware of? Well, I think it's firstly important that they know that this bill is being considered. Mm -hmm. And if caregivers are watching, you can contact your representative, your senator. I'm already sold on the importance right. of this, but if you have relatives or friends that live in other districts, then they could call their representatives and senators right. because I always feel that the squeaky wheel gets the grease because yeah. over 5,000 bills are filed every year right. and you really want to focus on the ones that are going to have a high impact and I really do think that resident advocacy makes a big difference because representatives and senators are going to pay attention to their own constituents. That's right and you take somebody like well, Brian Dempsey for example in Haverhill he lost his dad but his mother is here and um, haven't spoken to Brian in a while, but he's probably, you know, keeping an eye on his mom just the way I did. Um, and so he's working a full-time job. And, mm -hmm. and if there's any need to take care of, you know, in this case, a parent, it's, as you said, it's very stressful. You want to um, make sure it's being done correctly. And right. through this caregiver act, um, it will be done correctly. The, the good I thing about this it will work bill. well for everybody, won't it? I think so. Yeah. You know, uh, many, many bills that we consider are, are highly controversial, have pros and cons to weigh. I think that the important thing about this bill is that I don't think it's highly contentious. No. It's just that we need to inform folks that it's on the table for consideration. And it should be something that we can more easily pass because so many people are affected by it yep. and would benefit from it. I'll read the last paragraph of the editorial in the Boston Globe. To, and it talks about the changes you're talking about, and it says, together these changes would make a significant difference in the lives of caregivers and the family members who depend on them. Sooner or later, as a caregiver or patient, it's an issue most of us will take personally. Mm -hmm. And that, I think that pretty much says it all. 
Absolutely. Yeah. So, so I haven't heard any negative feedback from the legislation. I think it's just a matter of having enough momentum behind it to get it as a priority. Getting the word out there. And AARP is a, is a wonderful group in terms of advocacy, advocacy for older Americans. And um, to have them on your side, I think, is uh, very strong. They've written a number of articles in AARP publications with those statistics that you quoted mm -hmm. and the cost of caregiver. So they're, they're up on that. I was just going to suggest that if residents want to find out more information about the bill, the AARP website is a great resource. That's great. That's great. So that's one big area that uh, we're looking at in the year 2016. Any other subjects of import uh, that you're facing or that we're no. all facing? You know, pointing to the recent news in the Boston Globe, another issue that has been above the fold has been the possibility of legalizing recreational marijuana. Mm -hmm. And oddly enough, again, I picked up today's Globe, March 21st, in the headline above the fold, was key senator says no to marijuana, mm -hmm. and that's uh, Judge, uh, it's not Judge, it's Senator Jason Lewis mm -hmm. uh, from Winchester, I believe, that's right. who headed the panel mm -hmm. that did a study on that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. People may not be aware. I believe it's going to be a ballot issue this fall. That's right. And uh, the Senate president commissioned a group of senators to go out to Colorado, and Senator Lewis headed that charge and what they did was they wanted to see the impacts whether it was positive or negative on the ground in a state that has already passed recreational marijuana so they issued a very very large report well over a hundred pages mm -hmm. and it was to be an unbiased report for all the considerations if Massachusetts went that way and one of the things they found were were two very very large concerns one was that in Colorado the marketing that is extremely appealing to young people and children was pretty shocking. Yeah. So it's not only marijuana that's smoked, but edibles, and how with edibles, there's not a standard of measurement for consumption control, mm -hmm. and people were overdosing, which was really problematic. Yeah. There was um, an article last year on NPR radio about the Colorado experience and I was listening to it while I was driving in the car and I was pretty much shocked by the reactions of people in the medical field in ERs talking just about the overdose and I'm thinking overdose on marijuana and it was the edible marijuana mm -hmm. and as we talk about that there was also an article about the Colorado experience the edible marijuana included things like gummy bears mm -hmm. Uh, some type of edible marijuana that looked like gummy bears. Well, what does that mean to an adolescent child? Let's take a handful of these. Right. Um, very dangerous um, if taken in large quantities, never mind the fact that it might be going to kids, right, 12, 13, 14 years of age. Or even ingested by accident because they yeah. think it's a regular product. Yeah. The, the parallels in the marketing and the labeling between regular candy and snack products and the marijuana is really Very confusing almost, and dangerous. Almost deceptive. Absolutely. Yeah. The other issue that was really concerning was the idea of driving while under the influence of marijuana. Mm -hmm. Because right now there's no reliable technology for roadside stops. That's right. And no real basis for them to be able to judge what that level is. Right. So in Colorado they're finding that people are driving impaired, yeah. but it's very difficult to measure it. Interesting. Um, part of my life experience was serving as uh, the clerk magistrate of the Ames Redistrict Court from 1980 to 1985. That job entailed getting a phone call at all hours of the night if there was an arrest in the town served by that court, in which I had to drive down to wherever the court, uh, wherever the police station was, and release somebody from custody or not release them from custody if, in my opinion, they would be a danger to the public. Uh, more than once, I got called down to either Amesbury, Merrimack, Salisbury, or the state police in Topsfield for people arrested operating under the influence of marijuana. I remember one night in particular, wasn't happy to get out of bed in the middle of the night, get in the car and drive down there, but when I got to the police station, there was a kid sitting in a cell, and uh, if I can use a term from my days at college, he was wasted beyond belief, just totally out of it. 
So I was talking to the uh, police officer. I said, what's, what's the charge here? They said, operating under the influence of marijuana. I said, this guy was driving a car. And now I was down there an hour after he'd been arrested, so he'd been sitting around for an hour. He couldn't even tell me his name. He was just gone. And I just thought, so this guy's been driving all night or forever how long. And people say, well, you know, alcohol is dangerous for driving. Well, from what I saw that night, marijuana can be just as dangerous. And I'll give you another anecdote. Uh, the summer before last, I was out in Northampton, heading over the Calvin Coolidge Bridge from Northampton to Hadley towards Amherst, stopped at the lights just before the bridge, and I smelled something. The window was down, and there was a guy next to me smoking a joint. And he was taking hits of a joint, and he looked pretty impaired. I said to my wife, I'm staying away from this guy, and let's just see how he drives ahead of us. So there it is in the middle of the day, and if people think, no big deal, I can, you know, just light a joint and keep driving, uh, I'm concerned about that as somebody on the roads. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a couple of other issues that are unavoidable, one is the issue of secondhand smoke. Yep. So if someone else chooses to smoke it, it certainly isn't fair if someone who's near right. them or children in a vehicle ingest that secondhand smoke. Yeah, yeah. The other thing is, I can't stand cigarette smoke, having grown up with it. So if I smell, whether it's a cigarette or somebody smoking dope, uh, the smell just repels me. I, I just don't like the smell of smoke anymore. And as you said, secondhand smoke. How about a car with kids in it? How about 13 and 14-year-old kids who think because somehow we've legalized marijuana, right. it's okay to get high? And even the term recreational marijuana, what's really recreational about sitting around getting high? Maybe going hiking, going for a walk, jogging, playing golf, swimming, that's recreation. I don't think sitting around, you know, getting high on marijuana is what I call recreational activity. And so I think they're almost disingenuous to use that term. And, and doing any of those activities on marijuana is dangerous, yeah. whether it's biking or right. swimming yeah. um, or operating an ATV or yeah. anything like that. Um, you had mentioned the, the youth, and there was an interesting statistic that Senator Lewis quoted, and he said that in 1994, 65% mm -hmm. of youth perceived the harm of marijuana, and already in 2014, that's dropped to 36%. Wow. That's telling right there. Mm -hmm. That's telling right there. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's my big concern with this agenda uh, being pushed by those who want to legalize marijuana. All right, uh, you can say what you want about people 21 and over, adults, quote unquote, but what about the kids in middle school? Whose bigger brothers or bigger sisters, you know, have some pot upstairs in the bedroom and want to share some with them, or as you said, will buy something that you can ingest uh, as that trickles down into those lower grades, uh, I can foresee all sorts of problems. Especially in young developing brains. Yeah, let's talk about that, the medical part mm -hmm. of marijuana and some of the ingredients which people don't know. And the argument is, well, if we grow our own, it'll be all right. But the, 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 uh, the studies that have been done about the formation of the brain in marijuana are pretty, pretty uh, telling, I think, the ones I've read. The, the Senate report also spoke about concerns in terms of standards of production mm -hmm. to ensure that harmful or banned pesticides aren't used either. Right. There's another one. Yeah. Yeah. So people don't ha have any idea uh, now when they, and they'll say, well, if you buy it on the street, you're taking your chances. Um, you're taking your chances no matter what, what you're doing, mm -hmm. if you're ingesting or smoking uh, pot. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I'm, I'm concerned. I'm from the generation that I grew up in the late, late 60s, early 70s, so no stranger to people smoking pot. But as life goes on and as you get older and you get a little more mature and you see what's going on out there, you know, a lot of people in my age group are like totally dead set against this idea of making recreational marijuana something that uh, is going to be freely available. Yeah, I'm perfectly comfortable saying that I'm against it. Yeah. And um, many of the reasons that we've talked about are, are some of the reasons why and you know you really have to wonder when it comes to the fact that it took many many years for the state to figure out how to regulate medical marijuana why can't we just wait until that's been streamlined right. and the problems and the kinks are worked out 
before we delve into a whole new world. Right, and I'm a little almost angry about this uh, ballot uh, initiative because when I look at the big picture and what's going on in our society and what's going on in our region right now, and we can talk about opioid addiction in, in mm -hmm. a minute, but with everything going on, is it really that important that marijuana has to be made quote unquote legal? Is this really a big agenda item? With everything going on in our society, Who's the people that are saying, oh, this is what we have to do? I think mm -hmm. there's some money behind it. Okay. I think there are people behind it that want to make money, mm -hmm. and it's not about let's live free and, and just light up a joint. Exactly, and I think that's where we have to be realistic about this. I'm so glad that you brought this up because this is not going to be a nonprofit that's right. do gooder model yeah. where you talk about. Uh, you know, live and let live yeah. and, you know, tiptoeing through yeah. the, yeah. you know, tulips. It's really about profit. Yeah. And just like the tobacco industry, what happens? They want to expand their client base, yeah. they want to grow customers, and they want to make money. And we want to hit the younger, the younger smokers as soon as they can. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's ingenuous, uh, that, that that's, that's really the motive here. But I don't think people see through that, unfortunately. Maybe they will. As, as we head into the fall, but if you really look at it, there's money to be made here. That's why this is going on. It's not a bunch of 17-year-olds um, uh, with ponytails saying, hey, man, let's just, George Carlin, let's right. just get a little bit high. No, this is all about money and profit motive, at least in my opinion. And they saw when the, when the senators were out in Colorado where a marijuana cigarette would only have single-digit levels mm -hmm. of the chemical, it got to 100%. There are products on the market that are 100% pure. Wow. And, and that, that's the inevitable, to yeah. push the limit, yeah. and it only endangers public safety. Yeah. yeah, so we'll see where that goes, and maybe I'll do another show about that as uh, 2016 continues on. Mm -hmm. And now we talked about the opioid issue, and the governor just signed into law that, and that's gotten a lot of publicity. Maybe we could talk about that. It's had sure. devastating effects devastating effects in this community as well as your district and throughout the Commonwealth. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a crisis throughout the entire Merrimack yeah, Valley. Yeah. All, all seven of my communities are impacted. And the legislature in the last session passed a bill focused on expanding treatment options. Mm -hmm. In this session, a bill was focused on prevention. And the House and the Senate worked together mm -hmm. to create a compromise bill that the governor just recently signed, like you noted. And that's very, very important because you have to have so many tools in your toolbox to deal with this. Right. So when I talk about prevention, there were different spokes in this wheel, one of which was to create a stronger responsibility on the part of the manufacturers for a more robust drug take-back program. So the onus is on them, whether they want to issue envelopes that are prepaid postage mm -hmm. to send back or to have more drop-off boxes. Mm -hmm. But if those medications are sitting on shelves, it could be stolen, it could be misused. If they're dumped in the toilet, yeah. it gets in our water supply. Right. And if the manufacturers are creating this, they're the best equipped to destroy it right. and incinerate it. Yeah. That's in the bill. Um, another important provision is to create a seven-day limit on the initial prescription of an opioid, yeah. which is a big deal. And then for young people, there is an overall limit of seven days with the understanding that if you have palliative care, cancer, right. serious pain management yeah. issues, it's not about that. Right. It's about the idea that the FDA just said that it was okay to issue OxyContin to minors. And we wanted to counter that. Yeah. The other thing that is, I think, a, a best practice that other states should pay attention to is that this bill includes the option of what they call a partial fill. Mm -hmm. So that if you or I go to the doctor and are issued 50 opioids, you know, a quantity of 50, we can actually be empowered to say, you know what, I would rather have a prescription of 15, and if I need more, I'll come I'll back. I'll come back, yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for a lot of people that are suffering from all sorts of pain, the opioids have been, you know, regularly dispensed mm -hmm. to deal with the pain. But unfortunately, as uh, we've seen, some people um, get hooked on them or some people find out that somebody in the family is using them and they, they disappear and uh, we've got this horrible problem. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the other issue uh, was treatment. Um, and the idea finally uh, that maybe, yes, uh, people are addicted, uh, it, it is a crime, 
Do we treat them as criminals and put them in a jail cell, or maybe do we try to find them rehabilitation, find a hospital bed or, or some sort of treatment facility for women as well as men? I think it was women this year. They finally uh, freed up some beds. That was important. So yeah. a another big move was to end the practice um, for women that have substance abuse problems being sent to Framingham. Framingham and treated like criminals. That's right. And yeah. now Taunton State Hospital yeah. is being revitalized to free up beds for women so that they can get substance abuse treatment. Yeah. yeah, and unfortunately a lot of women that found themselves on the streets selling selling themselves literally were doing that to raise money to, to get uh, you know, get opioids and, and get drugs. Well, the vast majority you know? um, in the 90 percentile of women that are incarcerated yeah. have substance abuse addiction yeah. Yeah. problems. So we need as a society to treat that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And um, I think it, it's a, a situation where we need help on all fronts. So firefighters are responding with yeah. the application of Narcan. Narcan. Uh, police are responding with trying to curb the trafficking. Yeah. You have our court system inundated, the Department of Children and Families. Right. You know, we all have a role to play right. to address this, and um, I think that we're certainly not done. No. Um, it, it's important that this bill got passed, but it's a situation where we need to change the prescribing culture yeah. and, um, and, and hopefully make it so that the U.S. is not leading by leaps and bounds in terms of consumption of OxyContin because yeah. unfortunately most of the folks that are now struggling with addiction started with a legal prescription yeah. and heroin is so readily available and cheap. Cheap now, yeah. Um, you know, that's one of the problems. Yeah. So that's another issue. We're down to about three minutes. Maybe you've got a couple other subjects or another subject you like. Sure, to there's a on. there are a few bills that I'm trying yeah, to get let's across talk the, about those. the finish line. Yeah. Uh, one bill that's going to be before the Senate next week is a bill I filed um, to ban the practice of issuing unsolicited loans. So mm -hmm. if you or I get in the mail um, checks or loans that can be activated mm -hmm. readily, and that exposes us to identity theft it would stiffen the penalty. It would create a $5,000 penalty for issuing an unsolicited loan. And if it was issued and the checks were used by someone other than yourself, then the banks would be required to Great. issue in writing that you're not liable for those. I, I think that's a great bill because I've got those things in the mail. Uh, you know, payable to James P. Cleary the uh, third, 5,000, whatever. It's like an extension of your credit mm -hmm. card. Here are these uh, checks that get promptly shredded by me, but other people may not, or other people, older people may look at them and say, wow, I just got some extra money here. This right. is great. You know, the important There's thing for no folks for to that. know is yeah. that if they have credit cards pre-existing and they mm -hmm. get issued these solicitations, they can just directly contact their credit card company and ask them to stop sending them yep. Uh, promotions. Yeah. They can do that. Um, and in a lot of cases, these are companies that you've never even had any relationship right. with before. They just come out of the clear Exactly, yeah. exactly. And um, lastly, I wanted to point to a bill designed to create a housing relief for veterans. Mm -hmm. And it would be by local option of a city or town where they would be able to choose to have um, instances where landlords rent to veterans. Mm -hmm. And if the, if the landlords reduce their rent by $200 a month, then they could offer them a tax credit of $3,000 a year oh. on their municipal taxes to create an incentive to allow for veterans to move back to where they lived. That's a great idea. You know, years ago, post-World War II, there was veterans housing. There was veterans housing in Havel. That was Hilldale Avenue. That's how it was described. And now we've got a whole different generation of veterans, many of whom, as, as you recognize, don't have uh, adequate housing. Mm -hmm. And so this would work well not only for the landlord, but also for the veteran. And that bill was actually crafted by one of our local uh, veterans officers. Really? So it comes from experience. Yeah, yeah. So those are the people that really need to be recognized for the sacrifices they've made for the country. They volunteered. We don't have a draft. Mm -hmm. People have to keep that in mind with mm -hmm. veterans. They're all volunteers. They and, weren't and drafted. And the cost of housing right now is so competitive yeah. and out of reach for people where they might not feel like they can move back to the town where they were they, raised yeah, and they yeah. want to raise their kids. Where they want to live, yeah, mm -hmm. that's a great idea. Every program I have a Latin legal term. Ah, yes. And um, what I also do is give you the answer, not that you need to know the answer because you're, you're an attorney and a legislator, but we'll put it on the screen. It's ex post facto, and maybe we could talk about what does that mean? 
All right. Fortunately, the definition is right in my hand yeah. from your legal dictionary. Ex post facto, after the fact. That's right. By an act or fact occurring after some previous act or fact and relating thereto by subsequent matter. Thus, a deed may be good ab initio, or if invalid, at its inception may be confirmed by matter ex post facto. Okay. It's a good thing I took Latin, Jay. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> I did use ab, in, ab initio once in the past. I'll have to resurrect that again for my uh, Latin legal term. It's been great having you uh, on the program. We've covered three very important um, subjects. And you also have your own program. Let's talk about that for a second before we oh, close. Oh, sure. Well, so tell us about luckily, that. Luckily, HC Media asked yeah. me to do a show to talk about what's going on in the legislature. Mm -hmm. It's called Catching Up with Katie. Yeah. And so far, we've had some great episodes with local Haverhill guests. Yeah. And I talk about what's happening in Haverhill, mm -hmm. what's happening on Beacon Hill, and how all of that relates to the residents of the district. It's That's a lot great. of fun. That's great. So we're all using cable community media as a tool to educate and inform. That's what this program is all about. So thanks very much for coming on again, second time. We'll do it again. And maybe I'll have you on Catching Up with Katie. We could do that as well. All right. Okay. For a lot to talk about, I'm Jay Cleary. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed tonight's program with Senator Katie Ives, our local senator for the Havel District area. Thanks again. Thank you, Jay. Good night. Good night.